What's going on, everybody? Would you guys stand with us? We got a new song for you. Light is born in a moment as your voice is heard. Mercy wakes with the sunrise. Glory fills the earth. Here we stand.
You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, welcome to Element Church. My name is Brendan Anderson. I am the youth pastor here at Element. And whether you're here in service, out in the lobby, or joining us somewhere online, just want to say how excited we are that you guys are here with us today. If you're new here, I just especially would like to welcome you. When you came into the auditorium, you should have received a connection card. And if you can do us a huge favor, and just at some point during the service, fill this card out with as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. Then after service, I just invite you to take your next step and join us in the living room. The living room is just out these back doors and across our lobby. It is a space that we have designed and set up specifically for you and anyone who came with you today. And there are some staff and volunteers who would love to meet you. We'd love to answer any questions you might have about the church. We'd love to give you some information and then also just a free gift. Our way of saying thank you so much for being our guest. You can expect our service today to last about 65 minutes. And something we do here at Element every week as part of our worship is receive the offering. If you're a guest with us, please do not feel obligated at all to give to this offering. It's for those of us who call Element Church home. But for those of you who do give, either online, through our mobile giving option, or here in the service, I just want to say thank you so much for your guys' generosity. As some of you might be getting prepared to give, I just wanted to share with you guys a story that came into us uh, earlier this week. Element Church, I want to thank you for being you. I grew up in the church and with the Bible. I went to Christian school as a kid, but as I got older, I began to fall away from the Lord. In the past year, I found Element Church online, and now I listen or watch your Sunday services as much as I can. Keep being awesome and spreading the word. Thanks from a lost soul whom you've helped find his way back. 
Let's celebrate that story, yeah. Some of my favorite Sundays here at church is when we're able to present the gospel and then people are able to raise their hands and publicly acknowledge that their life was just transformed through Jesus. But what we don't often get to see is the much bigger reach that you guys have helped provide us with with our Facebook live streaming and our church online streaming platforms. And the only way we're able to do these things, the only way that we're able to reach so much farther outside these four walls of our church is because of your guys' generosity. So thank you so much for everything that you guys give. Ushers, you can go ahead and come forward and receive the offering. As I do, I want to let you guys know about a great next step that we have available for you today. Uh, about five minutes after the service is done today, we're going to be having a volunteer led by Pastor Andy that's going to meet right up here at the front of the stage. The volunteer is for those of you who want to volunteer, get more plugged in here at the church, but maybe you don't know really all the possibilities that you have to volunteer. And this is a great way for you guys to learn about every different serving opportunity that we have here at Element. So whether that's joining our hospitality team, the greeters, being in youth ministry, or maybe serving in our children's ministry, this would be a great next step for you to take to learn about what it would mean to volunteer on any of those teams. The tour is about 15 minutes, and like I said, we're going to meet five minutes after service ends. So if you do want to go on the tour and you have any of your kids checked into eKids, I highly encourage you to go grab them first and then bring them along in the tour. It's only 15 minutes long, so they can definitely walk around and hear about the different opportunities as well. But if you're here and you don't have time to go on the tour, we also have a table that's set up right outside these doors. It's a volunteering table where somebody will be to answer any questions you have about serving and then also able for you to sign up if you know exactly where you want to start serving already. So whether you're going to be on the tour or just stopping by the table, I highly encourage you guys to take that next step today. That's all I have for you guys. Uh, thank you again so much for being here. Let's stand up and continue worship.
guys may be seated. All right, you're dismissed. <laughs> I, don't know if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever had someone in your life that you wanted to be like, but for me, between the ages of 13 and 18 years old, I wanted to be like the Gatorade commercial said, like Mike. If you're new here, my name is Jeff Manis, lead pastor here at Element Church. So glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us today. I also want to say hello to those of you joining us on video. I know we got folks every week that watch here in the building on a TV somewhere or on the other side of the planet, and we are glad uh, that you are with us as well. I was a Michael Jordan fanatic when I was a teenager. In my ninth grade year of high school, I'm pretty sure I wore a Michael Jordan shirt every day to school. My parents can actually vouch for that. My twin brother and I, Jeremy and I, we truly believed we wanted to be like Mike. We actually had uh, this VHS tape, which I just lost about half the room with that. So if you don't know what VHS is, pull out your smartphone, go to YouTube and look up VHS. It'll blow your mind. It's how us old folks used to watch movies. Can I get an amen in the room today, right? It was not HD, I guarantee you that. But we had this old VHS tape called Michael Jordan, Come Fly With Me. And we wore that tape out, believing that we too could be like Mike. My brother, in fact, side note here, my brother Jeremy, we're twins. He believed so much that he was going to be like Michael Jordan and play in the NBA that when we were 15 years old living in Laramie, Wyoming, he made a bet with our cousin who lived in St. Louis, Missouri at the time that he would make it to the NBA. He bet my cousin $1,000. What's that to an NBA player, right? And so we're 43 now, our cousin's approaching 40, and every time we see him, he still calls my brother to pay off on his debt, uh, to which my brother wisely says, I'm not dead yet, there's still time, right? <laughs> so we wanted to be, even believed we could be like Michael Jordan. So spiritually speaking, here's where I'm going, is there ever a time outside of Jesus that we should want to be or even try to be like someone else. That's really been the focus of this sermon series we're in called Walk This Way. This is the last week in our sermon series. Uh, I believe it's been beneficial, at least it has been to me. I hope it has been for you as well. Next week we're starting a, a two-week mini-series. We just call it You Choose Sunday. We try to do it every year where you select the worship songs and you select the sermon content. So if you go to our website, elementchurchwy.com, click on the You Choose graphic. Uh, the polls close tomorrow and uh, so you can vote for your songs there, ask any question you want. We've got some great questions already. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. But in this series, every week, uh, we've been sharing with you passages from the Bible that I personally, my wife and I personally got to see or experience while we were on a tour of the Holy Land, Israel, uh, over the summer. And the whole point of the series is not for us just to see where Jesus walked, but for us to also start to walk like Jesus walked, amen? That's the goal of our lives. So I'll ask the question again, outside of Jesus, is there ever a time that we should want to be or even try to be like someone else? In the Bible, there's this guy named Paul. Paul has an amazing 
amazing story. If you don't know, Paul started 14 churches that we know of uh, recorded in the Bible. If you count churches that are not recorded in the Bible, but we believe he started them, it's around 20 churches that Paul started. Uh, uh, Through his ministry, he wrote 13 of the 27 letters included in the New Testament portion of the Bible. Uh, He had an amazing life and, and ministry. He's the main character of the book of Acts in the Bible. And outside of Jesus, he is perhaps the most influential person Person to Christian history this world has as ever known. Spiritually speaking, Paul sounds like a guy uh, that would be a great example to us, right? But if you know the story of Paul, you know that wasn't always the case. If you don't know, let me share with you who Paul was. Paul did not start out as a guy you would want to be like. In fact, Paul wasn't even his original name. Saul was his original name. Saul was alive when Jesus was alive. He was there when the first churches started to form after the resurrection. And here's the thing, Saul hated Jesus. He hated anyone who believed in Jesus, so much so that the Jewish leaders of the day actually made Paul the leader of a movement to wipe out Christianity from the face of the earth. So Saul would go out from town to town. He would arrest, torture, even kill men, women, and children for believing in Jesus. That's who Saul was. But one day on a road to another town to arrest more people, Jesus literally appeared to Saul. And he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Well, Saul puts his faith in Jesus, Jesus changes his heart, changes his life, gives him a new mission to go out and evangelize the known world at the time, but Saul was so bad, his life was so evil and so violent that he, when he went into new towns to tell people about Jesus, no one would listen because they thought it was a trick. They knew who Saul was, so they wouldn't listen to his message. So Jesus, Paul, Saul being so bad, you thought your life was bad. Saul was so bad, his name had to be changed. So God changed his name to Paul. And in one of the letters that Paul wrote to the Christians in a town called Corinth, we know of it as 1 Corinthians in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul, formerly Saul, wrote these words. And you, that's speaking to us as well, should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Hello. I I read that and I'm like, what? First of all, wow, right? I mean, talk about some, some confidence in your own spiritual walk to tell the world, follow me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'll be honest as your pastor, I want to be there, but I'm not there yet. There might be a few areas of my life I would say, yeah, imitate me in those areas, but not all of them. Imitate me, Paul said. But the more I learn about the life of Paul, the more I find myself feeling like I was when I was a teenager about Michael Jordan, that I want to be like Paul. I want to be like Paul. There's some things in his life that I want to be true in mine. Yes, my ultimate example, my ultimate desire for all of us should be to be like Jesus. But there's some things in Paul's life I hope are true in mine as well. And listen, you might be here and you might say, I I don't believe in Jesus. I'm about as far gone as Saul was, and so put me in that category. And listen, I get it. I understand. We make decisions in our life, and that's a decision you have to make to believe in Jesus or not, and you are welcome here whether you believe what we believe or not. But I just I want you to know that if you do choose to attend our church, the things I'm talking about today, this is who we want to be. And it's who we want you to be as well. And so here's the big idea for today. It's on the screens if you want to write it down, and it's this. I want what Paul had because what Paul had we really need. I want what Paul had. Because what Paul had, we really need. I'm going to change one word in that because I've been using it uh, already this morning. I'm going to say what Paul had, we desperately need. What Paul had, we desperately need. So if what Paul had, we need, here's the question that we're going to ask today. What parts of Paul's life do we need? What parts of Paul's life do we need? The main scripture is Acts chapter 20. 
verses 18 through 24. Uh, we are going to get there, I promise. It'll be a while before we get there. We're going to set the stage for, for this story. But if you do have your Bible, you can put your, your finger where Acts 20 is. It's the fifth book of the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. If you didn't bring a Bible, no worries. It's all on the screens. And I tell you every week, if you don't own a Bible, please don't leave without one. We'll give you one for free. Just ask for one at guest services or at the Next Steps wall. little background here to where we're going to find ourselves. In Acts chapter 20... Paul begins a journey that would not be completed until after the last chapter of Acts, chapter 28, okay? So his journey in Acts 20 starts out, it'll take him through Jerusalem where he'll be arrested for his faith. He'll go on trial before the Jewish high council. The Roman government finds out and they escort Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea where he would then go on trial before a Roman government for his faith in Jesus as well. He would eventually from Caesarea then be put on a prison boat, end up in Rome in prison, where from that prison he would write many of the letters in the New Testament we're familiar with, and he would eventually die for his faith in Jesus. But Caesarea is our focus for for today. Caesarea is a beautiful area right on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Here's a couple pictures I believe we have of the, the sea looking out from the ruins of Caesarea. It's literally right on the beach is the city of Caesarea. It was a significant town in the, the times of Jesus. It would have been a booming metropolis. Uh, Herod the Great built a palace in Caesarea, and many prominent Roman leaders would have uh, made their seat of influence right here in Caesarea. It's super cool to me that it was in Caesarea that the very first Gentiles, non-Jewish people, which I would imagine 99.9% .9 of everyone listening today is non-Jewish, we are Gentiles, it was here in Caesarea that the very first Gentiles, non-Jews, were welcomed into the Christian faith when God called Peter to go to Caesarea, to the ha ta a ha a home, I want to say a house and home at the same time, to the home of a man named Cornelius, who was a Roman soldier, the first Gentile to believe in Jesus, it was here in Caesarea that happened. So as we were walking through the excavated ruins, here's a picture of that, I was just moved thinking that perhaps it was in one of these homes, one of these rooms, where Peter first welcomed the, the Gentiles into the Christian faith, which, which if you think about it, if Gentiles would have never been welcomed, we wouldn't have been welcomed either. So significant things happened in Caesarea. Once Paul was in Caesarea, he was taken from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Once he was there, he stayed here at this prison. So that building there on the, the outcropping of rocks going out over the sea there, not, that's not the original building, but it was there that Paul was held in prison for two years. So for two years in Caesarea, he was there in that prison. He would be brought out occasionally to come before Governor Festus and talk about his, his faith. So for two years, that was, was going on. Governor, Governor Felix, I'm sorry. His case was then handed off from Governor Felix to Governor Festus, eventually gaining audience with King Agrippa. I know I'm throwing lots of information at you. We're going somewhere, I promise. So Acts 25 now, he's been in prison for two years. Acts 25 says this. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, that's his wife, arrived at the auditorium in Caesarea with great pomp. Accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city, Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. Now, this is really cool. That auditorium still exists in Caesarea. So here's a picture of the entrance going into the auditorium where Paul would have been, been taken. It would have been filled with people, including the king who would hear the case of Paul. And here's a picture now from inside the auditorium overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. Hopefully we get that. There it is. Isn't that amazing? Now, in Paul's day, you would not have seen the sea off of the stage there. That would have been enclosed, but I, I believe it would have been open air auditorium. Random note, Hillsong Worship did a concert at this auditorium. That would be unbelievable, by the way. I think Element should go do a concert. Who's going to go with us? Yeah, we'll get If you have about $5 million, let's go. So imagine this place literally full of people and standing down on the floor of the auditorium on trial was this guy talking about a man named Jesus. You heard he was dead, but he claims he rose from the dead and appeared to him and sent him on this 
mission. So here's a vantage point now from what Paul would have seen at the floor looking up into the stands of this auditorium. Now, as I stood at this spot and took this picture, I imagined what it must have been like for Paul. Those stands were filled with the most powerful and influential people of his day. Some of the people there would have believed in Jesus because of Paul's ministry. Others would have, would have wanted Paul to die so badly they came all the way from Jerusalem to make sure the trial ended the way they wanted. This all happened, this trial, 27 years after putting his faith in Jesus. He had started 14, at least 14 churches, seeing who knows how many people come to faith in Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He had healed the sick and raised the dead and cast out demons. He, he went from a person who executed people for their faith to being perhaps the greatest evangelist this world has ever known. And King Agrippa, gave, King Agrippa gave Paul a chance. He gave him a chance to speak, to recant his faith. But instead of recanting, Paul began to recount his testimony and talked about how Jesus saved him, set him free, and sent him on a new mission. In fact, in Acts 26, 17 and 18, Paul recites the words Jesus told him on the day he was made brand new. He says this, yes, these are words of Jesus looking back, I am sending you to the Gentiles, that's us, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Amen? It's awesome. And because he said that, he would never again experience freedom in his life. The rest of his days we spent in jail. If you read chapters 27 and 28, he was put on a prison boat from this point. Months later, he would end up in Rome, taking the gospel across the Mediterranean Sea into the heart of the most influential city on the planet at that time. And quite literally, because Paul stood firm in his faith in that auditorium, I can stand here today and talk to you about faith. That's how important this story is. That Paul, you see, this is a side note. The enemy thought he was silencing Paul. What he didn't know was that God was using this sentence to send Paul to reach the world. It's awesome. We don't always see the big picture, do we? So what did Paul have? This is my question. What did Paul have that made him so committed to his faith? What did he have that made him so committed to his cause? I've read this story before, but standing in that auditorium, I was so blown away by the courage and boldness and faith of Paul. I want what Paul had, because what Paul had, we desperately need, church. And here's the thing, those things Paul had were not something just given to him for that moment. These things we are going to see in our main scripture, they were with him for 27 years and beyond. They were a part of his everyday life. And there's, there's other things we could talk about, but in this main scripture, we're going to see three things because God moves through three points, okay? So we're going to see three things in this main scripture. There's others, but here's three we're going to see in this main scripture. So now we're, going to, we're in Acts 20 now, okay? So we're to our main scripture. I told you it would be a while, but we're there. Acts 20, 18 through 21. Paul's talking here. When they arrived... That was some friends of his. He declared, you know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. And I'll just let you know, as your pastor, that's my goal, <laughs> that I would never shrink back from telling you what we need to hear, whether it's publicly or in your homes. That is my, my goal. I have had one message, Paul said, for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus, and I'll ask for it again. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's powerful. So I want what Paul had because what Paul had we desperately need. 
So what parts of Paul's life do we need? I told you three things we'll see. The first one I see in this scripture is this. We need the heart of Paul. We need the heart of Paul. And I know believers in the room, you might be thinking, yeah, I want the heart of Paul too. I want his courage, his faith, his boldness, but I'm not talking about that. Like that's one of those things that he had that I'm not talking about today. I agree with you. I want that. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm not even talking about his salvation or his sanctification. That yes, I too, like Paul, want a heart that's been forgiven of my sins, saved and set free. I want a heart that's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what I'm talking about either. Here's what I'm talking about. I want Paul's heart for the lost. Paul's heart for the lost in his world was unmatched by any human in Scripture and outpaced by only Jesus himself, who was God in the flesh and laid down his life for those who did not yet know him. Paul's heart for the lost was unbelievable, unbelievable. He said, if I, I've never shrank back from telling you what you need to hear. I've had one message alone, the necessity of repenting of sin, turning to God, and putting your faith in the Lord Jesus. If you read Acts chapter 26, if you read the whole story of him in this auditorium, while he was giving his testimony, King Agrippa stopped him and said, are you trying to make me a believer too? And Paul said, King and everyone here, my prayer is that not only you, but everyone would be the same as me except for these chains. Paul's heart, listen, even in a moment where he could have tried to defend why he should not be in prison, he did not defend himself. He directed everyone to the only one that can truly set you free. See, Paul might have been in prison, but he was free, right? He was free. And he wanted the king who put him in prison, and everyone there to be the same as he was, saved without the chains, without being in prison. I mean, that, that speaks to the heart that Paul had for the loss. But I'm not sure there is any more clear or powerful of an example of Paul's heart for the loss than what we see when he wrote a letter to the Romans. It's called Romans chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. I'm not sure I fully comprehend what Paul's saying, but I'm telling you, it's powerful. Romans 9, 2, and 3, Paul says this. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. Watch. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. What? I mean, do we understand what Paul's saying? Paul is literally saying, I am willing to go to hell if my Jewish brothers and sisters would put their faith in Jesus. Like if I'm asking for volunteers for that today, none of us are raising our hand, right? Like I'm not there, church. I'm not there. I'm not, and there's people I desperately want to go to heaven. I'm not even sure I'd say that for them. Like I, I don't know if I'll ever be there. But I know this, I know that if I had a fraction of the heart of Paul for lost people in this world, I would be on my knees praying more than ever, preaching harder than ever, more determined than ever to see as many people as possible come to know Jesus, turn from darkness to light, and put their faith in the only one who can save them. A fraction of what Paul had. This last week, uh, I had the privilege of going with my dad, uh, Pastor Andy, and Pastor Brendan. We all drove to the beach, Beach, North Dakota. <laughs> 800 people, right? And there in Beach, North Dakota, we went to one of our sister churches. We're a part of a denomination, if you don't know. It's the Evangelical Church is the name of our denomination, very small denomination. We drove to one of the churches up in Beach who was hosting our annual district conference. And I just first of all want to let you guys know that we are a part of an incredible denomination that is doing their best to pursue the heart of God. 
And right now, I honestly don't know if we've been in a better spot spiritually in our denomination because the leaders of our church are desperate for us to reach more people. Our leaders at the very top level, their hearts are broken for the lost. And this last week, we were at our annual meetings. Our general superintendent, so the guy that's in charge of the entire denomination, on Tuesday night just preached a powerful word about how we as the leaders of the church, our hearts must be broken for the lost in our world. He then invited all the pastors and the leaders there. There's maybe 100, 150 people, maybe the most. He asked all of them to come to the front of the stage, like right here. And he said, we together right now are going to pray for the lost. He handed off the microphone to our district superintendent, so the guy who's in charge of our district, Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, um, and Idaho. That's our district. And he said, I want, I want your superintendent to lead the prayer. So he then said, guys, I want us to say out loud the name of someone who you, who, in your family who does not know Jesus. And he said the name of his 18-year-old son who just that day got a phone call that his son had broken parole and was going back to prison. And I'm standing next to Pastor Andy, my dad standing beside, behind me with his hand on my shoulder. And I could hear the names they said. It was names of people I personally know. And I spoke my name. And then he said, I want you to say out loud the name of a neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. And the 120 people, I could hear names. Tears, could hear crying. So I want you to say the name of someone who comes to your church but does not know Jesus yet and heard names. And I said names. Church, my heart breaks for people who don't know Jesus. We are headed, all of us are headed for a real eternity. And it will be the, either be an eternity with Jesus or a Christless eternity. Church, that should move us. I want what Paul had. Because what Paul had, we desperately need. So what parts of Paul's life do we need? We need the heart of Paul. And listen, I already had my outline done for this message. So when our superintendent preached that message, it was just confirming for me that this is what we need. A heart for the lost in our families, our neighborhoods, our city, and around the world. But yes, we need the heart of Paul, but we also need this, number two. We need the hearing of Paul. We need the hearing of Paul. Now, my wife might disagree, but I'm not talking about me needing to he see a hearing specialist. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not suggesting that any of you need to go to one, go to one either. I'm not talking about actual hearing. And the Bible scholars will be quick to tell me that there's no Bible evidence that Paul had good hearing either. I'm not talking about that. Okay? Here's what I'm talking about. All through the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, he was so in tune with the voice of God. So in tune. From his conversion all the way to his shipwreck in Acts chapter 27 on the prison boat, he heard the voice of God and clearly obeyed. And listen, if we have the heart of Paul, but we don't also have the hearing of Paul, it won't do us any good. Because once you have a heart like Paul's, then you are desperate to reach the lost. And when you're desperate to reach the lost, God's going to start putting you around lost people. But if you're not hearing his voice, you won't know where to go. So yes, we need his heart, but we also need the voice of Paul. And that's what he says here in Acts 20, 22, and 23. So he says, my, my goal is to reach people. Then he says this, and now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. And he went. Now this was not an isolated incident of hearing the voice of God. I encourage you sometime, even this week, read Acts chapter 9 through the end of the book, chapter 28. A couple of chapters a day, you get through it this whole week. And you will see time and time again that Paul not only had the heart of God, but he also heard the voice of God, which led him to do the work of God. But if I don't have his voice, if I don't hear it, I won't know where to work. And Paul would actually obey even when the voice of God wasn't what he wanted to hear. <laughs> So here in the main scripture, Paul said, the Holy Spirit tells me. I was kind of laughing, preparing for this message, because I've been guilty of this too. 
that typically in our American Christianity, when someone says, God told me, it's rarely followed by jail and suffering, right? That never happens. I mean, every time, typically, when I've heard Christians say, God told me, or I heard God, it's followed by words like this, abundance, favor, blessing, protection, provision, right? That's our American Christianity. I mean, most times when we say we've heard from God, it's usually for something that will make our life better or something good in our life, our definition of better and our definition of good. Sometimes, I'm about to go from preaching to meddling, just so you know. Sometimes we even claim that we heard God say things about our life that are contrary to the word that's already in our life. I've been in ministry for 25 years. I've been doing this as a youth pastor all the way to this today. So let me go into meddling for a moment because here's what I find constantly. God will never tell you to do something that is contrary to his word. Never. And you might say, well, God told me that's okay. You might have heard someone tell you it was okay, but if it goes against what he already told us, that is not God. I hear Christians tell me this all the time. I heard this so much as a youth pastor, okay? So teens in the room, listen up. Well, I'm not convicted about that. Listen, if you are not convicted by what you know God clearly calls sin and you are doing it in your life, it might be a sign that you don't have the Holy Spirit. Because when you have the Holy Spirit and you sin, your heart is grieved. And you have to do something about it. You either run further away from God or you run closer to God. Either way, your spirit's been grieved. Because the Holy Spirit resides in you. I think sometimes we wrongly assume that God's voice will always be for something good in my life, my definition of good. So if his voice doesn't fall within to my definition of good, it must not be the voice of God. We put caveats on his voice. Well, that was his voice because I agree with it. <laughs> when I don't agree, I don't want it to be his voice. Guilty, right? All of us would raise our hands and say guilty. This is why we need to have the heart of Paul before having the hearing of Paul. The heart of Paul was for people to be saved, to come to know Jesus. And whatever it took to accomplish that, he was willing to, to, to say to Jesus, talk to me. And when the Spirit spoke to him, he simply obeyed. And Jesus revealed to Paul that for him to reach as many people as he could, jail and suffering lied ahead. And so Paul said, I'm in. It's not what I want, but I want you more. And so I'm going. And that's where it led him. That's where it led him. One more medal, okay, one more. Let me, let me challenge the parents in the room just for a moment, okay. This, what we are talking about here. This is the kind of heart and this is the kind of hearing that we should be desperate for our kids to have. That they would have a heart like Paul's and the hearing of Paul, okay? So this is the problem with that. As a, I'm speaking as a parent, okay? When our kids discover this and God does a work in their life, and they have a heart like Paul to reach as many people as possible, and they have the hearing of Paul to go wherever he wants them to go, oftentimes that will lead our children away from our home. And so my question to us parents in the room is this. Would you rather have your kids close to home or in the center of God's will? Because it saddens me. I was going to use the word sicken, but I'm going to lighten it up. It saddens me in my ministry life how many times I saw Jesus-loving parents try to talk their children out of doing what God clearly had called them to do because their grandbabies wouldn't be close to home. 
So what we are saying is, child, I'd rather you be outside of God's will but closer to my front door. Woo! I hope it's hitting somebody. Hits me. I'm not saying it's easy to watch your children go across the globe maybe. But I'm so thankful for a a dad and a mom who modeled this their whole life and said to us, kids, we, we, we love you. We would love for you to be close to us, but wherever God takes you. And for seven years, my sister lived in China away from our family. She lost her triplet unborn sons while in China with no family there to support her. And on this side, my parents were broken. We want to be with you, but we can't. And we know, we know God has you there for a reason. That's what I want for my life. That's what I want for my kids' lives as well. I want what Paul had because what Paul had we desperately need. I want the heart of Paul. I want the hearing of Paul. And then lastly, we need the hope of Paul. We need the hope of Paul. And here's why this is so important. Because if I have the heart of Paul but don't have the hearing of Paul, I'm not going to go very far. I won't hear the voice of God, or if I do, it might be contrary to what I want, and so I just don't go. But if I do have the hearing of Paul, and I don't have the hope of Paul, I won't last very long if I go. Because oftentimes, when I hear God's voice, it takes me through difficult times. And if my hope is not in the right place, I will give up because it's too hard to follow his voice. I mean, think about the main scripture. Paul said, my life's been about one thing. Telling people about the wonderful grace of Jesus. Repent of your sins, turn to God. And I know that because of that, I don't know what lies ahead except for jail and suffering, so I'm going to go. And then he says this, Acts 20, 24. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news but the wonderful grace of of God. Paul's hope was not rooted in what would happen to him. His hope was rooted in who was going with him. He was going with the Lord. We sang about it in the song Cornerstone, that my anchor holds within the veil, the veil of Jesus Christ. My life's worth nothing, he said, And he wasn't saying his life was worth nothing. He was saying it's worth nothing unless if I don't have the heart of God and hear the voice of God and do the work of God and be rooted in the hope of God, it's useless without that. And standing there in that auditorium, he stood his ground. And instead of recanting his faith, he recounted his faith which sent him back to that prison cell overlooking the sea. Boarded a prison boat, shipwrecked on the way, ending up in Rome in another prison cell where he would write a few letters and give his life for believing in Jesus. One of the letters he wrote from his prison cell in Rome was to Christians in a town called Philippi. We know that as Philippians, I'm going to read from chapter 1, verses 20 and 24, from a prison cell, Paul wrote this. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Isn't that awesome? But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which is far better for me, but for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Paul's hope was rooted in heaven. He said, if I live, I seek Jesus and serve him. If I die, I will see my Jesus. So either way, I win. I win. The devil doesn't know what to do with Christians who live with that kind of heart. That maybe we can start to say, if I live, I'll seek Jesus and serve him. If I die, I get to see him. Either way, I win. (laughs) What can he do to someone like that? Nothing. Nothing. He can't do a thing. I want what Paul had. 
So Paul had we desperately need, church. I want the heart of Paul. Devoted to seeing people come to know Jesus. I want the hearing of Paul. Determined to go wherever he called me to go and do whatever he asked me to do. I want the hope of Paul. A hope not rooted in what happens around me. A hope that's rooted on who is inside of me and who is waiting for me on the other side. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And listen, this may not apply to you. And if it doesn't, you don't have to play along. But I want to challenge us, church. I want to challenge us to pray three specific things every day this week. I hope these become things we pray every day of our lives. Three things, though, this week. The first one is this. And you got to, if you're a believer, I want you leaning into God right now. I want you to pray for every day this week the first lost person that comes to your mind right now. And church, for me, it took a split second to know who I was praying for. And it hurts. It hurts the one that I see rejecting Jesus. Who is it? And I want you to remember that name and every day, Lord, please find them and save them like you've saved me. Second thing, I want you to pray. God, I'm listening. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, today I will do it. I'm listening. I'm telling you, you start saying I'm listening, God will start speaking. And you'll need to move. So, God, I'm praying this person is saved. God, I know there's lost people all around me that other people are praying for. So whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, send me. Last thing, and today, God, my hope is anchored in you. I pray they'll be saved. I pray you'll send me. I'm listening. My hope is anchored in you, my Savior. I want you to pray that every day. I love you guys. I love you guys. My heart breaks. Heart breaks for the people yet reached for the kingdom. Let me pray over you, then Pastor Brendan has some closing words. God, thank you for the life of Paul, how you saved him, set him free, and sent him on a new mission. Lord, I pray. I pray for those names that came up today. Whew. Lord, for many people, those are the closest ones in their life and that they don't know you. So, Lord, would you save them? Would you speak to us? Lord, help us to follow through. And, Lord, would our anchor be rooted in you? We love you, God. Give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, just a couple of things before you guys head out. If you're new, again, we would love to meet you in the living room. We don't want to take a bunch of your time, but we'd love to answer any questions, meet you, and then also give you that free gift just for hanging out with us today. And then if you're in need of any prayer, we have an incredible prayer team here at the church. They meet behind the sound booth at the Purple Tent. So if there's anything on your heart or your mind that you would like to talk to somebody about, have prayed over, they would love to meet with you afterwards. And then just a reminder that we are going to have the volunteer five minutes at the end of service. So if you're interested, go check out your kids, bring them back with you. But Pastor Andy will meet you guys right here at the front of the stage to take you on that tour. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you again so much for being here. I hope you have a great week. You guys are dismissed.